our bones are dried up, our hope is gone, and we are cut off. That was the experience of the people of Ezekiel during exile. COVID took us to exile within days, even though none of us had left our home, our state, our country. Within days, all of a sudden, we were in exile in a strange country, cut off from all the rhythms that pulsed out our living. At first, we were all hopeful. Oh, well, let's just give it a few weeks. We'll return back to normal. But as the weeks went on and on and on into years, it became clear that hope is hard to sustain. It took creative thinking to adjust to this new living in our workplaces, in our worship here. And as the hope of ever returning to normal dwindled, we could feel our bones drying up. The deep resilience that we thought we had began to pour out like water. Relationships changed. Relationships to each other. Some got broken irrevocably. We came back to this sanctuary expecting to see things just as we had left them. <laughs> but the fabric of the community changed too. And then we couldn't even sing here. We couldn't even say, how can we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? Instead, the question was, when will we be able to think about how we can sing the Lord's song in a strange land? Our bones are dried up, our hope is gone, and we are cut off. Exile is like a valley. If you eat the strange food in the valley long enough, if you adjust to that strange way of living long enough and make the best of where you are at, it becomes your valley. It becomes your home. So that you can no longer see what is on the horizon, you can no longer see the road out, or any sense of connection to the outside world or other places, it becomes your home. And you begin to believe the lie that God has abandoned you in that place, in the valley. My God, my God, why have you abandoned me here? The people of Israel, when they were in exile, they'd left the temple behind, and that's where they thought God was. And so in this place of exile, they felt cut off from God. Who are they going to trust now? In our world, trust has deteriorated in the past few years, hasn't it? You know how it works. You hear something, you get your phone out, you quickly fact check to see if it's true, and we don't trust anybody anymore. Humans become objectified, degraded in the process, because in the valley, that's what happens, degradation. What Ezekiel saw in the valley was this mass grave, all the human injustices, bones not properly buried, but lying everywhere. In that culture, to have bones exposed without proper burial was degrading, perhaps even the result of a curse cut off from God. Charles Taylor, the Canadian philosopher, said, for the first time in human history, there's a world in which God seems absent. People can happily organize their lives without God, cut off from God. Or Tom Fletcher, the once ambassador to Northern Ireland, said, we've been so busy building driverless cars, we've ended up with a driverless world. No direction, no way out. And the bones were dry in the valley, which means that they'd been there an awfully long time. They hadn't seen flesh around these bones for a long time. It was total death. Where's the death in you today? Is it in a relationship? Is it death in your faith? 
God, have you abandoned me? Am I always going to be here in this valley? Is it death in the church? Death in the denomination? Where is your death? Our bones are dried up, our hope is gone, and we are cut off. Even on an Easter morning, you can be sitting here thinking like you're the only one in the room today who can't be joyful and celebrate because those are the questions rumbling around in your mind. I'm dried up. I'm hopeless. I'm cut off. And so the question becomes, who is going to bring you resurrection today? God says to Ezekiel, son of man, can these bones live? God's saying to Ezekiel, can you imagine something different in this valley? Can you imagine that it's possible to get life out of death? It will need to come from an entirely other source. And I love how Ezekiel answers. He doesn't say yes. He doesn't say no. But he says, Sovereign Lord, you alone know the answer. It's not an answer where there's no hope. It's not despair, but he says, sovereign, God, you're in charge. This is not a driverless death valley. You're the driver, and only you know what's going to happen next. It's an answer of humble submission to God, saying, God, I'm out of control here. God, you're in control of this. I'm not. That's the hardest place to get in the West, isn't it? to admit we don't know, to admit we're not in control, to admit that we don't have the power to transform ourselves or anybody else, that we need this external source of grace and love and forgiveness to come in and soften us and change us where we are cynical and hopeless. Sovereign God, you alone know and so God gives Ezekiel this surprising command. He says to Ezekiel, prophesy to the bones and tell them, hear the word of the Lord. Now that takes bravery, doesn't it? To look out and start prophesying to dry, dead bones and trust that God is going to do something. And the thing is, in this culture, if you touch something that's dead, like these bones, it made you impure. That's the irony. It cut you off from God. So God is asking Ezekiel to do something that is impure. That's ironic, isn't it? But it's a sign of what God is going to do in Jesus. That it's a scandal that God is willing to come, willing to come and get involved in the mess and the pollution and the brokenness and the corruption. It's scandalous to touch bones that would never be brought into a sanctuary, into the Holy of Holies. But you see, what God is trying to show is God cares. That there's no place you can run from God. You may think you're cut off and dead and abandoned. You may think God is indifferent, dispassionate, distant, far away. But God comes to the mass graves to touch victims of atrocity and bring hope. Bring hope again. The problem is we like the less courageous approach, don't we? As a pastor, if I saw dead bones exposed like that, I'd want to arrange them and put them in the grave. Just sort them out, bring order, give them a proper burial. But prophesying means letting God be in control of the outcome, not ourselves. And that's hard for children of the Enlightenment who believe we're the producer of new things and new technologies and new philosophies and new science. 
and true resurrection gets relegated to the secondary place, God says, prophesy. Them bones, them bones, them dry bones, them bones, them bones, them dry bones, them bones, them bones, them dry bones. Hear the word of the Lord. That's what they're being told to do. Prophesy. Let go of control. Trusting that God will bring something into being. Them bones, them bones, them dry bones. Even when we don't understand where the road is to get out, God will provide a way. Them bones, them bones, them dry bones. Hear, hear the word of the Lord. Daring to believe that God can see every sin. How many bones are in the body, doctors? How many? 206, thank you. 206 individual bones to be put together in the right order. I could not do that. Could any of you? Maybe doctors can, but I certainly can't. Putting them back in perfect alignment. And then the flesh covers, the sinew covers, the muscle covers. But then God tells Ezekiel to prophesy again. The body is back together, but it's dead. So God says to Ezekiel, come and ask the breath from the four winds to come into these bodies that they may live. Bring the breath from the four winds back into the body. Now, why was it a two-stage process? Do you wonder? Why didn't it all just happen all at once so that Ezekiel could see it? Perhaps it's to do with the sixth day of creation when God took the mud and formed a body and then the breath came in. Perhaps it's to do with another sixth day when Jesus was standing before Pilate and Pilate said, behold, this is the man. And soon after, Jesus was saying, into your hands, Father, I commit the spirit and the spirit left him two-stage process. But maybe more importantly, I think it's showing what it means to be at home with God. It means having the Spirit dwell in you. In Ezekiel, he prophesied that the breath would come from the four corners of the earth. And the amazing reality of Jesus' resurrection is that it prepares the way for God to come again and put us home in each one of you. Human beings who then go out to the four corners of the earth and prophesy and be witnesses. We read in our liturgy, on the night that Jesus rose from the dead, the disciples were in a locked room and Jesus breathed on them saying, receive the Holy Spirit. God is faithful and God is doing even today what he promised to Ezekiel, I'm going to open your graves and bring you up from them. I'll bring you back home and you will know that I'm the Lord. The problem is, as you know, many exiles didn't get back home to their homeland. They died in exile. The problem is there are many people here today who've lived away from home. And you know how it goes. The longer you live away from home, the harder it is to get back. Your country changes, you change, and you feel distant. But the good news of the resurrection today is that Jesus crossed all those barriers, all those challenges, took on pollution, took on the curse of death, took on the challenge of abandonment. And Jesus didn't just say to each one of us, clean yourself up, get back into the Holy of Holies. No, Jesus said, the Holy of Holies is going to come to you. The Holy of Holies is going to enter into you so that wherever you are in life, you are home, home with God. Jesus removed the curtain in the temple so that we can have full access with God. And the people who know this the most are the people who've traveled and fled their lives and crossed boundaries and barriers, and they'll never be at home in this world, but they know God has given them an everlasting 
home. Climate change is bringing such instability that there's a clamoring for resources all over the world. And the question is, will we simply neatly rearrange all the bones, all the resources, or will we trust that God will get us out of the valley? Climate change driving many people west because it's impossible to live in their own country. I think of Simon Yak, someone I met when I was gathering hymns from southern Sudan. He's part of the Dinka tribe. Simon Yak was a choir leader. He wrote so many fabulous songs and he was one of the lost boys. You know the story of the lost boys, these young children who walked to freedom. And when I met Simon Yak, I was curious. I said, Simon, how did you get out? How did you get out? You were young. You didn't know where you were going. Such a big land, Sudan. How did you get out? And he said, well, we ate grass for three months, and we found our way by looking for the bones of people who had gone before us. And that gave us hope that we would get out. We just followed the bones. It's people like Simon Yak who've crossed borders who help us in the West find our way out of Death Valley because they've learned to trust. They've learned to pray. They've learned to prophesy. So what parts of your life are dry bones? What parts of your life has the hope gone? What part of your life do you feel cut off from God? You don't have the energy to imagine a way out of Death Valley. Jesus is the one who became this exile, who left comfort, who entered the valley, who practiced Union, reunion, forgiveness. Even when his body was being ripped apart, he was saying, I forgive them. Even though they're enemies to me, I forgive them. And for all the advance in world's technologies, for all the computer-generated sermons of that, what, which this is not one, because <laughs> I wouldn't know how. <laughs> Staff can tell me, <laughs> and they can tell you how bad I am with technology. But nothing will compare to a Savior who's able to empathize deeply in our sufferings. Machines can't do that for you. To have the compassion to say, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Breathe life into us again. Nothing can do that other than a Savior. A God who takes us beyond romantic internal feelings, a God who gives us his spirit to guide us into transformational truth so that we can find our way home. So even, even if you're a Michigander and you're sitting here today and thinking, I don't belong, I feel I'm in a strange land, you can rejoice. God is in you and with you. Even when relationships never fully get reconciled and back to the way things were, you can be at home for God is with you and in you. Even when you find it hard to sing the songs today in a strange land, God can come and restore the years the locusts have eaten. And when you embrace this, you become like that story we read in the Gospels of those two Marys. You don't just become resurrection, but you become the means for resurrection for others. They're the ones now who are traveling out to the four corners of the earth, spreading the good news. They're the ones who go to the disciples and communicate Jesus is alive. And our job as Christians is not just to be the resurrection, but to be the means of resurrection to others who need it most, to surprise others with fresh glimpses of truth. This week in our homeland, we're remembering the Good Friday Agreement made 25 years ago to bring peace. A difficult road, many long nights spent in secret places where negotiations were made. And I was listening to Tom Fletcher, the British ambassador at the time in Ireland, 
describing how night after night he was in the peace talks. And there was one night he had two leaders in the basement of the parliament buildings in Belfast. And they were enemies. And he said it had got to stalemate. They couldn't talk. In fact, one of the leaders had turned his chair and was facing this way and wouldn't even look at the other leader because that leader had murdered his sister. Couldn't look at him. Couldn't talk. And it was 4 a.m. in the morning. And Tom Fletcher said, then we got the news that this leader over here, his mum had died. And he had to break the news in this room and try and say, look, let's stop the negotiations. We have to pause. We have to let this leader go home and bury his mother. This leader said, no, I'm going to stay here. My place is in this room. Because in rooms next door, people are talking about us, putting labels and stereotypes on us and putting walls between us. And what we're doing in this room is much bigger than all of those stereotypes. We are working for peace, so I'm going to stay. And then the leader over here who had his back turned to him, he turned round and they began to talk again. And the peace talks were brought to completion. When Jesus died, he was like this man here, cut off from his parents, cut off from his father. God didn't come down to save him. He let Joseph of Arimathea put him in a borrowed grave. But Jesus stayed in the room. Jesus stayed in the room for you. Jesus stayed because he had this bigger idea of peace. Jesus stayed because the idea of cosmic reconciliation was at play in the room so that we could turn our chair and face Jesus again. So what's it gonna take for you to turn around and face Jesus? Maybe it's simply saying to God, Sovereign Lord, you know. You know the mess I'm in. You know how hard it's been. You know the relationships that I'm really in a stalemate with. You know. And I'm tired of trying to hold on to control, so I give it back to you. All things are possible with you. Maybe it's looking to those who have crossed boundaries and divisions and become inspired again, because you're a little cynical, but inspired again that res resurrection's possible, reconciliation is possible, peace is possible. Or maybe it's opening your heart to forgive. Rather than organizing the bones in the valley, maybe it's saying, I choose to make that difficult step of turning around, receiving forgiveness from Jesus Christ so that I can forgive my greatest enemy. Because the reality is, my friends, valleys are not for staying in. Don't make the valley your home. Valleys are only for passing through. Do you know what it says in Psalm 23? Even though I pass through the valley, of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for God is with me. God's rod and staff bring comfort to me. So surely, surely, goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Valleys are for passing through, not making your home in. So arise, get up, fix your eyes on Jesus and be on the move in the name of the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.